You're listening to the Fierce Fatty Podcast, episode 52. I am your host, Victoria Wellsby, and today we're talking about Tom Hanks. And I'm going to give you some definitions and revealing some acronyms that might have been on your brain. So uh, let's do it. I'm Victoria Wellsby, TEDx speaker, best-selling author and fat activist. I have transformed my life from hating my body with desperately low self-esteem to being a courageous and confident fierce fatty who loves every inch of this jelly. Society teaches us living in a fat body is bad, but what if we spent less time, money and energy on the pursuit of thinness and instead focused on the things that actually matter, like if pineapple on pizza should be outlawed or if the mullet was the greatest haircut of the 20th century. So how do you stop negative beliefs about your fat body controlling your life? It's the Fierce Fatty Podcast. Let's begin. Hello, hello, fatty. How are you? How's your life? Are you feeling good? You all right? You all right? Great. Amazing. Thank you for being here with me. I so appreciate it. I'm just getting over a, a cold that my nibblings gave me. Very rude. <laughs> children, if you're around children and they have any sickness, it's like guaranteed that you're going to get it because they're like, rub their snot all over their hands and then like reach their hands into the back of your throat and um yeah sorry if that's like a disgusting image there for you um yeah but now today um uh, my voice is is sounding a little bit better we had a uh, a call for fierce fatty academy the day before yesterday it's thursday today so we had it on tuesday and it, it went for two and a half hours and at the end of it i was like my voice is done and the next day I couldn't speak and so but today it's sounding all right isn't it and maybe even a, a little bit sexy so husky oh anyway <laughs> I'll, stop. I'll stop talking about that update so last episode I was telling you how the BBC slash RTE reached out to me to be on a show and uh, I didn't know whether I was going to say yes or no and I said it depended on how much they were going to pay me I believe in being open about how much people get paid, especially everyone. I think everyone should be, but uh, especially uh, women or people, um, anyone who has any type of marginalised identity, because uh, uh, something that is used as a weapon of kind of, you know, you know, when workplaces are like, oh, don't discuss salary with, with your colleagues and stuff. And it's because, you know, your male colleague is getting paid like 15 grand more than you. So you don't want to discuss it because if you find out, then you'll realise that you are getting uh, shafted. So anyway, so the BBC, uh, I spoke to them the day after I recorded the last podcast and they were like, great, we want you on. You're amazing. Obviously, they didn't say that. <laughs> this is me pretending that they said that. Anyway, they said... We want you on, um, the fee is £150. And my, what I was looking for was 1000 And so I said, um, no, thank you. And they said, okay, what about 175 And I said, no, thank you. And then they said, what about 300 And I said, no, thank you. And um, not to say that that wasn't good money, for a theoretically 10 to 20 minute TV segment, but I would have to go there and spend, it'd be like a day, a day out of, from my business. What I really wanted was some benefit to the potential very triggering and difficult task of dealing with a fat phobe. And my thoughts are, if you're not going to pay me decently to deal with a bigot, a weight bigot in a high pressure environment, live TV, then it's not worth my time. And as soon as I, uh, I kind of came to that conclusion, I just felt really good about it. You know, 
Whereas before, because you know what they said to me, they said, don't forget about all of the exposure. <laughs> like classic exposure. Exposure. Honestly, listen up here now. Exposure is bullshit, right? Honestly, honestly. Uh, so when I did that BBC show last year and it was 2.6 million viewers, I think. And then since then it's been on the BBC iPlayer. And so I don't know how many people have watched it since, but I still do get a lot of people messaging me saying I watched it. Um, so imagine if your business, if you have a business, got 2.6 million um, eyes on it. And of course, not all of them are going to be people who are fat positive. But I presumed with that many people, that would have a big impact on my business in regards to um, revenue and followers and whatnot. And really, it didn't. It really didn't. I might have got a couple of thousand new Instagram followers and I might have got a, a thousand new subscribers on my email list but really for because I didn't get paid to do that well we didn't talk about it so actually no I did talk about it with the um, other fat positive people yeah so I just thought you know what even if 10 million people are listening to this live thing how you know that exposure is not really worth anything to me so if someone's saying to you oh come and do this thing for free and you'll get exposure it's it's unlikely to really benefit you unless it's, I don't know, Kim Kardashian sharing your product or something. I don't know. It had to be something really big because you just presume, oh, from that amount of exposure, then things are going to be really, you know, big. And of course, yes, lots of people have been exposed to my vision at business, especially over the last year um, because of that. But going on this segment which was going to be uh difficult and annoying that a thousand pounds is what i um what was what i wanted in exchange for that experience and it felt good to say you know what nah it's good it's good but like i said in the last episode if someone had come to me and they said oh um we have this other thing and it's paying 150, but it's like something fat positive. I'll be like, Fuck, yeah, let's do it. It's great. You know, if it's something that I can fit into my schedule and whatnot, then um, it's about, you know, what, you know, the positives and stuff that you're going to get from it. And being around weight bigots is not positive for my brain. Um, so, yeah, a little update for you. I want to share the spill the beans, give you all the details, tell you what's going on in my life. So you would not have seen me on it the show was on last night and I wasn't on it. There we go. I actually said to them, hey, why don't you contact Dr. Joshua Woolrich? He would be good because then it'd be a doctor against a doctor and also a thin white man against a thin white man, which is like a more of an equal fight, even though that is absolutely shit to have a show talking about fat people with no fat people. But... Um, because of his weight privilege, because of his size privilege, because of his gender, uh, more people would have listened to him, which is, you know, bigotry in action right there. But it would have been a fairer fight versus a fat person against a doctor. You see what I mean? So anyway, I, I messaged Dr. Joshua Woolrich on Instagram and said, hey, by the way, they're going to contact you. And he's like, oh, OK, OK, cool. I don't know if he went on or not, but anyway, doesn't matter. It's done. So. I got an email, I wanted to share it with you, not from the BBC, not from RTE, from uh, a listener. I want you to read it out here. So uh, it says, Dear Victoria, this is an email from a listener. I've been listening to your podcast a lot lately and I feel compelled to write and thank you for the work you do. I am currently straight size. I live in the US and had to look up what that meant after hearing you say it a bunch of times and have been for around 20 years, but I grew up fat and very poor. I was bullied mercilessly as a kid and had innumerable bad experiences at the hand of teachers and doctors because I was fat. And I was on the receiving end of, end of a lot of fat shaming from my family. And surprisingly, these experiences deeply affected my sense of worth. And I've either lived with an eating disorder or just wildly disordered eating pretty much my whole life. For a long time, I think I believed that if I just quote unquote made it, whatever that means, I'd get over the traumas I sustained when I was fat and quote unquote move on again, whatever that means. But so far, and I'm 41, 
no amount of objective success, like getting a PhD, having kids, earning a good salary, buying a house, etc., have touched that deep sense of worthlessness. So, right around the start of the pandemic, I made a hesitant commitment to try and confront these deep issues. I read Body Kindness, I started listening to podcasts, and um, which is where I heard you guesting on someone else's show, and it started to seem like there might be another way, but it wasn't fully clicking. It didn't feel fully, dot, 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 human, question mark, to me. Like, I'm all about listening to experts, but where... But where was the funny, the raw, the hurt that comes along with being fat in this society? None of it quite landed until I started listening to your podcast, which is why I wanted to write and say thank you. I love listening to you talk, love your anecdotes and your, in brackets, really pretty crappy analogies. Wrong. How rude. (laughs) That's, That's me. That's me saying that bit. But most of all, I love that you are real about what it means to be in a fat body. It's not all science or politics or media. Sometimes it's just the dickhead you dated forever because you didn't think that you're worth more. Or the jerk doctor who told you that you caused your own scoliosis by being fat. That happened to me. It's a real pain and it's real, really personal. Anyway, I know I'm not your target audience. I have so many privileges as a thin, cis, middle-class white woman and I have no intention of co-opting yet another space for people like me. But you're really helping me confront my own shit and acknowledge that I have real healing to do. The laughter you bring to your audience and the generosity in which you share your life and experiences are unique and I know that I am the not the only person who's not, brackets, currently fat, who is living a better life because they are including you in it even though you don't know them. Thanks again, Josie. Thank you, Josie. I really appreciate it. That has actually inspired me to sharing some acronyms and definitions because Josie mentioned um, uh, that they had to look up what straight size was. Maybe in one episode I might have mentioned different... I haven't actually done an episode on definitions and and whatnot, but I I thought I'd just... let's get them all out here now so that you've got them so that moving forward we're all on the same page of what things mean right and also it's that was a really nice email to read I was like yes thank you very much and also um this podcast is centering a fat person me and is centering fat issues um and it's important because how many spaces for fat people are there like hardly any especially spaces for fat people which is not oh it's so horrible to be fat let's go on a diet but the hating your body and fearing being fat and having weight bias affects like everyone no matter your size and so working on this stuff is important for everyone and also in Fierce Fatty Academy, which is my uh, my program, it, it's I let anyone, any size person in. But we centre fat people and fat bodies. So, um, you know, being mindful of sharing a picture if you're thin of your thin body might be triggering in a fat positive space. Things like that. Straight size people, you're welcome here. You are welcome here. And also, fat bodies are centred here. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, what is straight-sized? What is fat? What is uh, the definition of all of these different acronyms that we have in uh, fat politics? Let me share, let me share some with you so that uh, you know and I know and we all know what's going on uh, because uh, Josie had to Google straight size and straight size is not a, a British term necessarily. It's something that's used just in the fat positive space around. <laughs> I'm like waving my hand around, you know, around, <laughs> around, around the place, around the place. So first thing, fat. Now I've had this question a lot is, who am I am I am I fat am I 
am I in this this cool gang of fat people? Am, can I call myself a fierce fatty? Um, so for me, there is a one question you can ask yourself to work out if you're fat or not. There is something, and I'm going to tell you what that is in a second, but there's something that's that's really cool that Ash from The Fat Lip, The Fat Lip is a podcast, go check it out. Um, Ash created something called The Fatness Spectrum. I'm going to link to the, um, the Instagram post that has this uh, in the show notes. To get to the show notes, go to fearsfatty.com forward slash 052 for this episode. Or you can always just go forward slash podcast and you'll get to the most recent show. Okay, so Ash from the Fat Lip has created this. This is this is Ash's spectrum. And Ash acknowledges this that it's it's imperfect, absolutely imperfect. Um, and you can you can call yourself whatever you want, right? So you might identify as um a bigger fat or a smaller fat or whatever okay you, you just whatever it's no big deal but this is just a guide and the reason why we use this guide is to understand that someone who is smaller fat is able to move through society a lot easier than someone who is a mid fat a super fat or an infinity fat i'll show you what what those are in a second and to recognize that someone who's smaller has a massive degree of privilege like, for example, my size, I'm, I'm a kind of, I'm a, I'm a medium fat. Last time I went to the fairground, went there with my ex-boyfriend. And the last ride we went on, it uh, got on, all the attendants came around and they couldn't shut the thing. So I had to get off the ride. Someone who was a size smaller could have ridden on that ride. Someone who was a little bit bigger would know that they wouldn't fit in any ride on in the fairground, whereas I fit on some of them. So to recognise that it's different depending on your size, how you experience the world. Now, if a super fat person or an infinity fat person goes to the doctor, it's more likely that the doctor's going to be like, oh, wow, have you considered going on a diet? Whereas with a smaller fat person, it's still likely that they're going to be prescribed a diet, but it's less likely. So the smaller fat person is experiencing a lot of privilege because of their body size. Now, a reminder, privilege doesn't mean that your life is easy, that it's all rainbows and fairy tales. It just means that it's not harder because of that one facet that you have privilege in. So if you are, have a smaller sized body, you have privilege because you can buy clothes from stores instead of just online. You can fit into chairs. Um, more people will date you. The world is made for you more than if you were a bigger fat person or if you're straight size and if you're fat. OK, so this is the fatness spe spectrum. Totally imperfect because there's uh, we're talking about clove size here. And, you know, it's just, imp it, whatever. But it's just, you know, it gives you an idea. Okay, so a small fat person is, this is US sizes, someone who is a size 1X or 2X, or a size 18 or lower, or in torrid, a size 0, 0 to 1. And so underneath here we have finds someone who can find clothes that fit at mainstream brands and can shop in many stores. So... That's not me. That's not me. There's one shop that I can shop at when I go to um, the city. Okay, so mid fat. 2X to 3X, size 20 to 24 US. A torrid, size 2 to 3. Now, can shop at some mainstream brands, but mostly dedicated plus brands and online. So that's me. Okay, super fat. A super fat is 4X to 5X, 26 to 32, torrid, 4 to 6. And super fat, where the highest sizes at plus brands can often only shop online. Okay, next is infinity fat. I love the word infinity fat. It sounds like a superhero. So infinity fat is 6X and higher. 
34 and higher, some torrid size 6. And says, very difficult to find anything that fits, even online, often requires custom sizing. So you see how just in clothes, how being just a few sizes different can mean that you have to have clothes made for you, which is bananas, or being able to just go to the local city centre, town centre, mall, shopping centre, whatever, and being able to pick up stuff easily. And that's, we're just talking about clothes here and think about all the other ways. Okay. So now the first thing here is the small fat was 18 and lower. So does that mean that everyone who's size 18 US and lower is a small fat? Well, no. Um, but the reason why uh, Ash has not put a, a lower kind of cap on it and saying, well, if you're size 16, then you're fat. But if you're size 14, then you're not fat. It's because bodies are different, right? You're like, yeah. Uh, Someone can be a, a shorter person and be a smaller size, but be recognized as fat. So the question that you can ask to work out if you are fat is, have you experienced discrimination or bias because of the size of your body? And when I say the size of your body, the fact that it is, quote unquote, too big. OK, so it's not discrimination as in people have said you're not eating enough food or you're too thin. It's discrimination and bias around the fact that you are too big. So if you have, you know, maybe your mum one time said, oh, you should really um, go on a diet. But in the rest of your life, you've been able to find clothes that fit. You've been able to get jobs most people will date you. You've never had to um, think about seating options when you go out places. Then you're probably not fat. You might be chubby. You might be straight sized. Who knows? I think you'll know if you've experienced stigma because of your size, because people have viewed you as being too big. And and it's like it's no it's really like no hard and fast rule, but it's important to also recognize that a lot of people use fat as a descriptive word for their feelings. And they say, oh, I'm so fat. I feel fat. And then when you look at them, they are clearly not fat. They're a straight sized person or they are ever so slightly chubby. Right. And that's harmful. Um, but if you, you know, it's, if you feel like you have had, um, discrimination and bias thrown at you because of your body size, you, you're probably fat. Um, so I can't tell you if you're fat or not. <laughs> if you're clearly, if you're clearly not fat, you're probably not fat, but you know, whatever. I know you all want to be in this cool club of fatties. <laughs> You're desperate to be fat. I know. <laughs> I know. Some people are like, no, I don't want to be fat. And that's okay. That's, that's your, uh, that's your weight bias coming out. Okay. So I mentioned the word straight size there. And that was something that Josie said, what well, straight size? So straight size, we say the word straight size, straight size, meaning someone who is not fat. And the we the reason why we use the word straight size versus someone who is thin is that most people who our straight size don't identify with being thin. Unless, you know, someone is thin, thin, um, very small, then they probably wouldn't describe themselves as thin. They see themselves still as too big. And so a lot of people don't identify with that word. Whereas straight size is a really good catch all of saying you're not fat. So you have privilege, right? So that is what straight size means. Now, uh, in that is thin privilege and thin privilege is like we're talking about with, with size privilege. It's just another version of size privilege that if you are thin. And so when we talk about thin privilege, we, we're talking about straight size privilege. So thin privilege is everyone who's not fat, but we just say thin privilege. Um, you could just say straight size privilege. Thin privilege is just easier to say. So thin privilege is, you know, everything we talked about that 
if you go to the doctor and you're sick, the doctor won't put you on a diet. You'll be able to fit in everywhere. You'll be able to buy clothes. You'll be able to date people and they won't discriminate against you because you're fat, etc., etc. Now, something that we see in the community is something called something called the thins tm not everyone does the tm but i like it because it sounds funny (laughs) the thins okay and so people think oh this is derogatory against thin people no it's not what we're talking about when people say the thins is people who are straight sized who are bigoted who deny that there's anything called thin privilege who when a fat person says hey um don't be bigoted towards me then a thin person like say if it's a social media post one of the thins will say well i get i get people tell me that i'm really thin all the time and they tell me to eat food that is who the thins are it is straight sized people who are not educated on weight politics and they center themselves um in very harmful ways and there's a difference between someone who's like oh I'm, i don't understand this concept um can you explain this to me and um you know i'm newer to this and being respectful versus if i put a post up saying oh um something about thin privilege you better bet guaranteed there's going to be Uh, Thin people, straight sized people in the comments being like, how dare you say that it's hard to be fat? My life is really hard because I'm thin and people have made fun fun of me because I'm thin. And I'm like, you're missing the point. (laughs) That's not the point. The point is fat people are being systemically um, discriminated against. Fat people die because of weight stigma. Thin people, straight sized people, that won't happen to, right? It's and of course it's not okay to say to people to comment on people's bodies ever. It's not okay to say to a thin person, eat something. But that is not the same as living in a world that hates you because of your size. So when we say the thins, TM, we're talking about straight size bigoted uh people. So if you're thin, you're not you're not necessarily one of the thins. <laughs> Does that make sense? If you're straight sized and you're like, I oh, know, fat people are cool, you know, fat people should be, you know, treated like straight sized people, then you're not a uh, one of the thins. So yeah. Now, um, you might see things uh this acronym I W L. I W L stands for intentional weight loss. Now this is something that is fairly common um, in you might see in social media posts. Now the reason why we say intentional weight loss is to ding- distinguish between the fact that um, sometimes people people's bodies changes changes all the time, right? You put on weight, you lose weight, your weight stays the same. That's just what bodies do. But when you go on a diet, you are engaging in intentional weight loss. And when you engage in intentional weight loss, um, then that weight loss is because it's coming from a place of intention, a diet. You're trying to do something to to lose that weight. That is when um, that weight loss is not necessarily sustainable um, and it's not good for your mental health, your physical health, etc. Whereas unintentional weight loss like you're just going about your life and then one day you realize oh I'm I weigh less I didn't notice um that type of weight loss is not necessarily harmful you know maybe you maybe you were sick and of course that's not something good but um it's not the same as someone being like okay I'm gonna diet and I'm gonna uh, do loads of workouts and stuff like that it doesn't have the same effect on your mental and physical health. But of course, if you've lost weight because you were sick, then it affects your your physical health. Um, Yeah, so there's a distinction there between saying one is is potentially harmful and one is potentially not harmful. Um, And as well, when you're engaging in intentional weight loss, you are saying that you believe in diet culture, you believe 
um, smaller bodies are healthier and better in whatever way and that your body would be better and healthier in whatever way um, and turning your back on the science. So that's what IWL is about. Now, next, WLS. What does that mean? WLS, weight loss surgery. So that is what WLS. So if you see someone is engaging in IWL with WLS, then they are engaging in intentional weight loss with weight loss surgery. Now, a lot of times you might see weight loss surgery and the weight loss is in quotation marks. The reason for that is because the surgery often doesn't lead to long-term weight loss. And so it's kind of like, it's not really what it does. Right? So it's kind of quote unquote weight loss surgery because uh, yeah, often doesn't lead to weight loss. Okay, BOPO and FATPO. So I get people asking what these ones are. It's easy, body positivity and fat positivity, just shortened because they're long words. Technically, they're the same. So body positivity was about fat positivity. It was about advancing the acceptance of marginalised bodies. And then it was co-opted by um, thin white women, um, straight sized white women, uh, corporations and turned into love your body, which it's not. It's a political movement. And so in response to that, a lot of people don't, a lot of people who are fat positive don't identify with the term body positive. Like, I wouldn't necessarily say body positive, like I'm a body positive person. It, I might say that to someone who's totally lay and not into this at all because it's a recognisable uh, phrase. Um, but I would more identify it as being fat positive. So fat positive is saying, you know... I'm really, I'm here for the fats. I'm not here for the fluffy bullshit, you know, love your love your body and buy my soap shit. And like, oh my God, look at my tiny, teeny, tiny little roll on my belly. Look, when, when, I, when I crunch over and, and squish my body as much as possible, I get like one millimetre of fat. And it's really important that I show that on the internet for people so that they know that I'm oppressed. Um, so... Fat positivity is kind of, you know, for me, it's saying, listen, I'm not down with that BS. I'm down for fighting for fat people. And that's what body positivity is too, but it's been co-opted and it's been changed. And now, you know, how language changes all the time, it's kind of changing into and has changed into um, white feminism. Okay, so Hayes, H-A-E-S health at every size. So health at every size uh, first uh, came around in the 1960s. A lot of people think that Lindo Bacon uh, coined health at every size. They didn't. Uh, Lindo wrote um, a book called health at every size. Um, and Lindo has never said, oh, I created this or anything. But a lot of people just see that Lindo wrote the book. <laughs> so they're like, Lindo wrote the book on it, so Lindo is the person. But um, it's been around for a while. And actually, the copyright is owned by ASDA. Here's another acronym for you. A-S-D-A-H. ASDA. ASDA is Association for Size, Diversity and Health. So you, a lot of times you see Hayes with the, with the um, R or the C. It might be the R or a C. Probably R. Um... Yeah. So basically what Health at Every Size is saying is that you don't need to uh, lose weight to engage in health promoting behaviours and that you can work, work towards health no matter what your size is. I.E. is our next acronym. I.E. I.E. is intuitive eating. Intuitive eating created by uh, Evelyn Tribolet and Elise Resch. Uh, who wrote the book on it in 1995 and has 10 principles. Now, a lot of people take these principles and they turn it into a diet. Intuitive eating is not a diet. Intuitive eating is not mindful eating. So you see a, little, a lot of um, people uh, promoting mindful eating as a way to lose weight. And that's not intuitive eating. So mindful eating, think about like, 
people are like, oh yeah, intuitive eating, it's great. You know, the type where you, you know, you chew your food 75 times and then you swallow. And I'm like, mm, that's a diet. <laughs> that's like mindfuck diet. That's not intuitive eating. Intuitive eating is listening to what your body wants and healing your healing your relationship with food by listening to what your body wants. And it's not what a lot of people think, people who don't get it, they think intuitive eating is, I'm just going to eat the Twinkies forever and cheese Whiz and, and blocks of lard and that's all I'm going to eat forever. And that's, that's not what it is. Because if you truly allow yourself to eat everything, you know, if you eat 20 blocks of lard, you're probably like, no, nah, I'm done with the lard now. Now, now I want a variety of food. Not that eating blocks of lard is bad. Do what you want to do. But that's not what intuitive eating is. Okay. Why we asterisk the O words and why we say the O words. So um, the O words are overweight and obese. Now, um, when we write it out, where the E is, the first E in overweight and the E in obesity, we will put an asterisk when we write it out. The reason is because it is a slur. Those words are a slur and we don't, you know, I don't even like to say them. And when I do, I, I, I will say, quote unquote, I haven't, I didn't just then, but you know, we're talking about it because they are slurs. They're not, um, they're not accurate. They're made up. All words are made up, but <laughs> they are not uh, accurate um, descriptions of what human bodies are obesity means to have eaten until gotten fat do people who are classed as obese is that is that their reality is that why people are fat no is the answer there's there's um literally hundreds of reasons why people are fat and and um none of them are the quote-unquote fault of that person and also the categories the, this comes from the bmi scale right those words come from the bmi scale the bmi scale uh, was created over 200 years ago by Adolfi Quitwedle, Quitwedle, Quitwedle. <laughs> I don't know how to say his last name. Quitetet, Quilet, Quiletet. I don't know. This is just at the top of my head, right? And uh, who was not a doctor, not a physician, a mathematician who said, let's look at the size of human bodies, looked at um, uh, European white males and said, this is, this is what generally European white males uh, look at and even at the time he said listen up here now motherfuckers don't be using this as a, um, an indicator of health especially on individuals because it is looking at statistically body sizes of white european men cisgendered men uh and uh but then insurance companies came along and was like oh the way to make money let's tell fat people that they're gonna die and then um and then that's the term morbidly obese came around when uh, a doctor was like oh we need to come up with a word that's really scary to make people think that they're about to die and so they said "Ooh, add on morbidly onto obese and then that's how that came about and the categories have been shifted to be smaller and smaller throughout the years so that insurance companies can make more and more money and it's not a good indicator of health at all especially on the individual level. So anyway, those O words are offensive. Um, they medicalize bodies. They uh, make it so that fat bodies are seen as diseased and problematic. And they're not. We're amazing. Okay, last one. Fat misia. F-A-T-M-I-S-I-A. Or fat Mizic, F A T M I S I C. So this is something as an, a, a a word that is an alternative to fat phobia or fat phobic, and the reason why people are using this word more and more, although I've only seen it a few times, and I just thought, oh, it's an alternative to fat phobia, and now looking into it, um, learning why. There is this new alternative. I say new, it's been around for years, right? Um, but these things take a while to catch on. So fat phobia, the word phobia is a fear, right? Phobia is a real 
um, disability, right? If you have a deep fear of something and, and it, it's debilitating towards your life, that is a mental illness. Now, when we talk about fat phobia, we know, we know we're not talking about people who are like, oh my God, I'm scared of fat people. We know that we're talking about weight bigots, right? Um, but by using that word phobia, um, we're suggesting that those people have a mental health condition and in turn, this is reinforcing negative stereotypes against those with mental illness. So it's an ableist term to say that they have a phobia, which is a mental illness, and saying there's something wrong with them. They, I mean, like, there's something wrong with them in regards that they're, they're bigots. They are hate mongers. And um, the word... Uh, misia, I think it means hate. Yeah, I think it means hate, yeah. Hatred of fat people, prejudice against fat people. So, and that's really what it is, right? Is people who don't like fat people, they hate fat people. And as well, like with phobia, fat phobia, I always say, like, really, it is true that we have a deep, deep, deep fear of being fat, and um but not in the sense of a true phobia i'm sure there are people who are actually you know in the truest sense of the word fat phobic but that probably comes from bigotry I, I don't know people are phobic of lots of different things right um yeah so i actually had a conversation with reagan chastain my idol from dances with fat is Reagan's website. Absolutely incredible writer. I'm just, uh, I love it so much. She's really funny as well. Uh, so Reagan Chastain, I had a conversation with her. Um, and this is what she said, a conversation over Facebook uh, Messenger. So uh, I, I said to her, what do you think about um, fat phobia versus fat misia? And she said, this is an interesting question. I've definitely seen the term fat misia being used and looked into it. I think there are two prongs to this for me. The first and most important is that the idea that using phobia as we do in terms like fat phobia, homophobia, etc., is harmful to those who have phobia. Phobias. The second is the term's usefulness in my activism. For the first, I've thought about this a lot even before the term, uh, I saw the term fat misia in regards to um, phobia being ableist. Um, understanding, of course, that people with phobias are not a monolith and that there's always a possibility that I am wrong. I do not find it to be a serious issue. The dictionary lists two separate definitions for phobia, which I think is reasonable and clear. And I do not believe that the use of one is impacting negatively the use of the other. As an activist who is fat and queer, I've personally made the decision to continue using terms like fat phobia and homophobia in my activism because they are commonplace and clear per the definition an aversion towards dislike of or disrespect for a thing idea person or group since misia isn't common knowledge it would put me in the position of having to do extra labor each time i use them there are many terms which i don't use and for which i always try to do the labor of educating when i do see them including and especially terms that aren't as aren't part of my personal identity. And if misia becomes more commonplace, I may well switch to using it. But for right now, I've decided not to personally take this particular, take on this particular additional labor. So that's, that's uh, really interesting from, from Reagan. And I, um, I agree, like um, fat phobia, we all know what that is, right? But whereas fat misia, we, um, like Reagan says, it would be an extra, uh, it'd be a barrier. It would be a barrier to doing this work. And um, it kind of reminds me of the barriers when it comes to formal education. And, you know, when people are writing papers 
and um, books and, and whatnot, and it's very academic. And you can't get through it because it's just not written in language which is easily understandable. And I don't want any barriers to be in place where people don't understand what I'm talking about when it comes to fat phobia. Um, but also, I want to be cognizant that um, some people may not like that term. And also using a different variety of terms as well to explain what I mean. Terms that other people might use as well, like weight stigma or white weight bias. And uh, so so if you see that in, in spaces, then that is what that means. It's a more inclusive word to say someone is a massive bellend. Fat misia. Fat misia. Fat misia. So, yeah. You want to talk about Tom Hanks? I do. So, I want to talk about Tom Hanks because he has got a juicy lesson. I know. America's America's dad, America's uncle. I wish Tom Hanks was my uncle. Um, so, we're going to be talking about uh, why Tom Hanks can teach us a massive lesson. And that lesson is not just how to dance on a giant piano. Um, how we can harness this one single lesson to create huge positive impacts on our body confidence and knowing why, knowing why is life changing, literally. And by the way, in this section here, I'm going to be talking about feeling like I want to not be alive or or how um, this stuff is life-threatening hating your body is life-threatening and so if that is a uh, a trigger for you then know that that's coming up I'm, i don't go into detail i just say this stuff could kill me sort of thing but it's in there so let's talk about it but why tom hanks has the answer <laughs> what are you talking about victoria okay so tom hanks tom hanks i just hope i hope never news comes out that Tom Hanks is like a predator right you know Tom Hanks being one of those those people who we who you're like oh they're just a good person they're a good person let's hope they stick and um don't turn out to be a massive bellend another version of that is um Will Smith for me I'm always just like Will Smith he's just so a good guy I think <laughs> so anyway what about Tom Hanks today not Will Smith so um a film that I absolutely love, if you don't know me already, I love films, right? A film that I absolutely loved when it came out, and I've watched it probably five or ten times, is Castaway. Now, if you've not seen Castaway, don't worry, I'm not going to give away the plot. I watched the trailer to make sure, like, in the trailer you kind of know what the plot is, so I'm not going to give away anything that's not all in the trailer already. Uh, but, you know, it's been out 20 years, so you had, you've had you got fair... You've had fair time to watch it if you haven't already. So Tom Hanks is uh, stars in this film, right? Castaway. So Castaway, um, what it is, is uh, Tom Hanks, um, his character is called Chuck Noland, and he works for FedEx. And uh, on Christmas, he is called away last minute to do a FedEx delivery in an airplane and the airplane crashes. He ends up abandoned on this desert island in the middle of nowhere. So Tom Hanks, he is in a relationship with someone called Kelly. So Kelly uh, drops him off at the airport at Christmas and they're in the car and they say I love you and Kelly gives him his um, Christmas present which is her grandfather's pocket watch you know those kind of like old-timey uh, pocket watch you know you press the button and the top flips open and inside when you open it is a picture of her and um, he says he's, he sets it to Memphis time and he says that he's always going to keep it on Men Memphis time which is where Kelly is um Tom Hanks leave and he says I'll be right back so he's stranded alone on this desert island he has the pocket watch um and the only other things that he has are um packages the FedEx packages that came from the plane so most of them are destroyed but some of them wash up onto the shore and most of them contain um rubbish that he can't use but some things he might be able to use just like a little bit um so one of the things in it is a volleyball, the brand Wilson. 
and um, he, Wilson becomes his friend. And so Wilson is kind of like this, <laughs> his buddy that's on the island with him. And uh, actually, I named my cat Wilson after the volleyball in Castaway. So I must have liked this film a lot. And actually, it's a good film. It scores scores well on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, so during the time on the island, we know from the trailer that he eventually manages to, to escape the island. But he's on there for four years and he experiences great difficulty. So when he... Um, when he first get, lands on the island, he has nothing, right? Um, just a few clothes, his pocket watch, those parcels. And um, he has to learn how to find shelter and to find food and water and create fire. And not only like the basics of living, but also um, like looking after his brain and like mentally, emotionally surviving without much hope. His hope you can see in the film is he keeps looking at this pocket watch and this picture of Kelly, his partner back in Memphis. And when he's having a bad time and when he feels like he's losing his mind, he looks at that picture of Kelly and he survives because he had a reason to survive. He had a why. Kelly was his why. And because he had a why, he didn't just give up, which is what a lot of people would do in that situation, understandably. He was able to overcome uh, injury, hunger, thirst, fear, exhaustion, loneliness, insurmountable odds, because he had this this person to go home to. And he had that, um, that why to survive. Why? Because I get to see Kelly again. And the Kelly's the love of my life. So the reason why I tell you all of that is that we all have a why for why we are doing things, even if we don't realise it. OK, so we all have a why, like a capital W, why. So connecting with your why is super important. So you have this metaphorical pocket watch to remind you why you're doing this doing this, when I say doing this, working on getting rid of fat phobia and diet culture from your brain. So my why, personally me, for why is it that I needed to love my body? Why is it that I needed to get rid of all of my fat phobic thoughts? Well, my why was, if I didn't, then I was probably going to die. Now, that might sound like hyperbole, but it's true. It's true. There there was so much going on in my life, right? So I experienced years of abuse, homelessness, being mistreated at jobs, um, and all sorts of other circumstances, which I blamed incorrectly on my body size and the fact that I lived and live in a fat body. And I was doing unsustainable things to try and make myself thin and if I was thin, then I would be worthy. Then I wouldn't be mistreated or abused or, you know, have all of these shit situations happen because people would see my thin body and be like, oh, wow. And I'd get the best boyfriend and the best job and suddenly become rich and all sorts of things. Right. Um, I mean, it was exhausting. It was exhausting. It was exhausting um, trying to become thin and it not working and my mind in my mind it was become thin and finally be happy and you know no longer be abused or mistreated or sad etc or die like my route to happiness the way that I saw it was to change my body which you know it's totally, you know, a, uh, unhelpful way of thinking. But the way that I saw it is that I had two routes, you know, this route of becoming thin and therefore happy and worthy and lovable and da da da, or die. And when I discovered that I couldn't become thin, I didn't want to accept, eventually, I didn't want to accept the bleak alternative. Because I didn't want to die. But 
trying to become thin all the time was exhausting. It is so exhausting in, in so many different ways and so sad when it doesn't happen and when you try so hard and your body fights against you. Um, and so I didn't want to continue being exhausted or die. And so I decided I wanted to try to live and fight for my life, literally. And, um, and that was my why. So I was so exhausted and so done with all of the bullshit that I had experienced in my life up until that point that I was so motivated. My why was to live. And so if I was on that desert island and I had a pocket watch, the picture would be of a happy, thriving Victoria being alive and um, not being so exhausted and fed up and um, have all of these negative things happening all the time because she believed that there was something wrong with her body. So that was my kind of deep, deep getting down to the core of it is I wanted to live. And once I got out of that place of, I'm not sure if I can survive, this is really rock bottom for me, I really feel terrible, I really feel shit. Once I got out of that um, and was able to see, okay, you know, I think that I'm going to uh, be able to get over this and I'm feeling good and I'm feeling better. My next level of what I what my why was at that point was that I wanted my presence in the world to be a good one. I wanted my legacy to be um, something positive. I wanted to stop hurting others with my fat phobic, body hating, diet culture bullshit that I believed and regurgitated to others. I didn't want to die and people just be like, oh, well, you know, she tried to become thin all her life and was obsessed with her appearance and didn't really do much because she was scared about what other people thought of her and she kind of made, she gave me bad body image, say if I had kids and she made me feel shit about myself or whatever it is. I wanted my effect to be on the world of um, something positive and something good, you know? And so that was my kind of like next level of my why. So it's kind of like uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you don't know what Maslow's hierarchy of needs is, it is the, the, the things that a human being needs to survive. And so the bottom ones um, on the hierarchy of needs are things like water, food, shelter, um, stability, somewhere to live, you know, a job, uh, love, um, and then you can move up into the other categories, which is um, self-actualization. And so once I got that kind of basic thing of I'm alive, then my why evolved into other people as well. And that's that's pretty common. Right. So. Knowing my why meant that when it felt impossible, I could keep going when I made bullshit excuses like I don't have the time or I don't have the money, uh, I don't think I can do it, I asked myself, do you want to live? Do you want to continue that life, which was really fucking horrible? Well, then quit all of these bullshit reasons that you're giving yourself why you can't do the work because it was bullshit for me. Um, you know, I didn't want to die because I hated myself so much. So it helped me overcome and it inspired me. So what is your why? Now, the first thing that could come into your head of why is it that you want to learn to love your body? You could say something like, well, I want to feel confident wearing a piece of clothes, like a, a crop top or something with no sleeves or a swimsuit or whatever it is. Or you could say, I want my partner to have a confident and vibrant, vibrant person to be with and um, me to be happier around, you know, people. Or you could say, I want to do things like I, I want to stop saying no to certain activities because I'm worried about my body. So what is underneath that? 
What is underneath saying that you want to feel confident wearing a piece of clothes? What is underneath saying you want to see, um, you want your partner to see a confident, vibrant version of you of yourself? What is underneath when you say, um, I want to be able to do things? What's really underneath that? What is the real kind of deep, dark, or the bottom reason? And it could be that you want to belong. Um, you want to feel loved and accepted. Is it that you want to start living your life and that your why is the same as, as what mine was, is that if I don't do this, then I might die. Everyone's is different and no why is better or worse. But if you don't really have a why, then it, this is probably not something that, 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 that it is important for you. And that's fine, right? So um, example, if someone said to me, um, Victoria, why do you want to row across the English Channel in a in a boat? I don't want to row across the English Channel on a boat. I don't not want to do it. But you know, if someone came up to me right now and was like, "Right, we've got the equipment, we've got everything ready to go. Here's everything. You're just going to do some rowing. It's going to be fine." Then I'd be like, "Oh, okay. You know, I'll give it a go. Why not?" But I don't have any deep desire to do it, and so um, my my motivation, say if it started to become really hard. I'd probably be like, ah, fuck it. I've had enough of this. Let's go get a cup of tea, <laughs> you know, because my why is it's not there. You know, why do I want to row across the English Channel? Well, I don't really. I'm not that bothered. It might be fun. It might be an experience, but I'm not that bothered. I could take it or leave it. And so if when you're trying to think about your why of why you want to learn to love your fat body and you're like, eh, whatever, I don't really, it's not a big deal, then that's a really great clue for you that. This is not something that you necessarily need to pursue. But if when you start to think about it and you're like, do you know what? I really want to do this. And I know that this affects my life so deeply. Then you have a why. And that why, knowing what it is exactly, is really helpful to keep you motivated when things get hard. So for the people who do row across the English Channel. So for those who are not from the UK, you're you're rowing between the um between England and France and it's like a it's a long way. It's I don't know, probably takes a few days of rowing. I don't know, clearly I've never done research in this. But um it's hard, right? Is what I'm trying to say. And so the people who do it, they have a why. They they want to do it for some reason. I don't know what it would be. Because <laughs> I think, well you know it'd be fun, you know, it'd be challenging, but I I don't know why because I don't personally want to do that. Not that I wouldn't want to do it, but you know, you know what I'm saying? So understand what your why is, because you know, when that person is roaming across the English Channel, you better believe that when they're hungry and are tired and it's raining and they've been rowing for hours and they just want to go to sleep and they think, fuck this, I never want to see water again. They're digging deep and they're finding something um, in them and it's coming from a place of this is why I want to do it and this is why I want to succeed. So what is your why? That is my question for you today and maybe you can write it down, put it on a little post-it, put it somewhere and so when you're feeling like maybe, I don't know, oh this is not that important or or making some bullshit excuses that you know are bullshit or saying, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to do this thing because it's too scary. Think about your why. And if your why is important, then it's going to be a really big motivation to you. And again, you might not have a why. And then that means it's not important. And that's fine too, because we all have different paths in life. Uh, but if you know that hating your body and, and feeling um, out of control around food is, is, is hurting your life, then there probably is going to be a, a, a big why as to why you're doing, why you want to do it. So yeah. All right. So thank you for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate it. It's a long episode considering I have a dodgy-ish um, voice. It's, 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 it's hung out, isn't it? It's, it's um, what's the word on them? It's, it's survived. <laughs> um yeah so a reminder if you haven't already to get the 
Fierce Fatty, Body Love Roadmap. It's going to tell you how to get from meek and mild to courageous and confident, all the steps to take to get to a place where you don't think you're a bag of shit because you're not a bag of shit. Um, yeah, so go get that. Go into the show notes to get that. Um, go to the show notes as well if they're not right in front of you on whatever app you're listening to by going to fiercevalley.com forward slash podcast or for this specific episode it's fiercevalley.com forward slash zero five two because it's episode 52 zero five two all right okay good you feeling good you feeling good 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 i'm feeling good all right well uh stay fierce fatty and uh, I'll see you later, crocodile. Okay, bye, bye. Thanks for listening to the episode. And if you feel ready to get serious about this work and want to know when the doors open to Fierce Fatty Academy, which is my signature program where I teach all about how to overcome your fat phobic beliefs and learn to love your fat body, then go to fiercefatty.com forward slash waitlist. Again, that is fiercefatty.com forward slash waitlist to get your name on the waitlist for when Fierce Fatty Academy, my signature program, opens. 